The giveaway for this Challenger RT six speed ends this Wednesday. Click on the link in the description, whynotyougear.com. Find out how to enter this black on black Challenger with only 42,000 miles on it. Once again, whynotyougear.com. Click the link in the description. Thanks. I really didn't think this day would come. I get to drive my dream car, and I know, it's probably odd to have this as a dream car out of everything I've ever driven on RCR. A vehicle from an age rife with platform sharing where nothing was wasted because it couldn't afford to be. The realization that you're no longer in a spit economy. You're in swallow times now, buddy. Hey, you ever think about how the word combust is just a combination of two words that are euphemisms for the same action? Oh yeah, no, totally me neither. Look at this beautiful unibody heartbreaker. This is a car that resists sublimation by the collective, an island unto itself, surrounded by a vast, impenetrable void. The AMC Eagle conquers where the beat booping offerings of the 1980s fall short, taking on hills and rough terrain and giving a stiff middle finger to the plainclothes futurism of cars that wanted none of this smoke, because everyone wants to be Batman until it's time to square up with Bane. Of course, I say that, but a lot of those other cars survived where this died. You look at something like the Subaru Loyal, or the Leon, or the Brat, and wonder how they stuck around as long as they did, whereas the Eagle lasted for less time than it takes for a movie set in the 90s to play two princes, because they don't trust you'll know it's the 90s otherwise. I mean, it's not surprising, but... That doesn't mean it's fair either. Okay, look, I won't pretend that a lot of my love for this car isn't because I basically grew up in one. This was a car I came to love over long road trips when I was too prone to motion sickness to do anything else but become intimately acquainted with the blistering hot vinyl seats with GM air conditioning like a movie theater in midsummer. I came to love messing with the easily unlatched locks on every ride home from school. My mom was a teacher in the same elementary school my brother and I attended, and so we arrived and left together every day. My brother once opened the moving car door out of curiosity on Lancaster Avenue and nearly got grounded for the rest of his waking life. There's something meaningful about things you love as a kid, because who and what we love are the first choices we get to make on our own. But is it a regression in nostalgia to meet your memories, to risk finding them lacking in comparison to the blossomed imagination? Your mind might remember having fun playing at grandma's, when reality was that grandma's idea of play is you sitting still and her raising one finger to her lips every quarter hour. Or looking forward to staying at your dad's on the weekends, when reality was that his idea of fun is the board game Don't Wake Daddy except for real, and it's two in the afternoon. Now, this Eagle, lovingly provided by our good man Harry, has a 4.2-liter six-cylinder with Motorcraft 2150 two-barrel electric choke matched to a three-speed automatic transmission. Power ratings are in the neighborhood of 115 horsepower at 3,200 RPM and 210 torque at 1,800 RPM. Now, this is the only year without the viscous four-wheel drive, just open diffs. This is also, from what we could find, the only year without a locking torque converter. And when you drive it today, it's a lot further away from what we might think of as a crossover, feeling much more similar to a pickup, if you can believe that. But this was Harry's first car, which he bought when he was just 16. He purchased this at 87,000 miles, and it now sits at 126,000 miles. And over time, he's done a lot of part swapping thanks to his proximity to a salvage yard. This has Dana 35 axles, and while Jeep guys regard it as the worst axles ever, this does allow for limited slip diffs. Fuel economy for Harry has averaged at between 18 and 20 miles per gallon, and his best was on the highway in upstate New York at around 28 miles per gallon, and his worst was 12 miles per gallon just rolling around town. But for its time, the Eagle got pretty great fuel economy, especially coming off of a second oil crisis. Hell, that's great now, considering the gas pump might as well be pouring out Chivas and Hennessy for what you're paying these days. Yeah, just in case you couldn't tell I'm aging, I'm complaining about gas. As I drive my Mustang. <laughs> Ugh. The AMC Eagle is the automotive equivalent of a keep-off grass sign planted directly into grass. It can go off-road, but that's not really the point of an Eagle. 
What makes this car glorious other than a visual style that I feel entirely alone in finding attractive is the peace of mind afforded by the design choices AMC made, offering a unibody four-wheel drive passenger car with great fuel economy and an aggressive ride height that Subaru bros spend thousands to achieve at a time when that wasn't exactly the norm domestically. To say the Eagle was ahead of its time would be to do a disservice to linear time. After filming, Brian and I talked about this, and I referenced the old quote by Martin Paget about how this car was responsible for midwifing the SUV, and how it came along at a time before Americans were really ready to accept it, which is something of an oversimplification. But here we are. And he wondered onto his notepad why AMC didn't continue to develop the Eagle in its waning years before throwing his mechanical pencil down in sadness. And I get it. I wish these were still around, even as I accept that this isn't the type of design you can necessarily just port over unchanged into the modern era. Although I don't think it would be entirely out of place either. And yet, while I grew up loving this car, I did agree with Brian's assessment. It looks great, but it fails to deliver a driving experience that really lives up to all the hype, even by the standards of its own time. Now, don't get me wrong, I absolutely had a blast in this car, and it was so wild to finally be able to get to drive this, but it's less about offering you something fun and more a means to the end of having a car you can rely on, and trust to take you over a wide variety of different terrains, whether it's hard-packed earth, a salad of detritus on the woodland ground, or the snow of northeastern Pennsylvania in mid-January. This car fulfilled a slot for 4x4s that weren't trucks. The only logical comparison we can think of for competition's sake was the Subaru Loyal, sort of. But that was a four-cylinder that made what? Like 80, 90 horsepower? The Eagle, at least to me, was just simply a better car. And yes, the steering is all over the place, and it's sort of like trying to follow the curves in a straight road. It's not fast, it doesn't have tight cornering, or an engine that announces itself. And it's rare to think of a car that draws such attention to its utility, but it also suggests a new sort of classic car, not the sleek, vaunted appearance of the muscle cars and winga-dinga cruisers of yesteryear, but a classic car aesthetic that places utility on a pedestal, that you revere it because of how functional it is rather than how it looks. Because if it lasts this long, the idea is not that it remains cosmetically perfect, but that it's still mechanically sound. There is only advancement with this car, no detention. It's a student who cracks a walk-off joke as class is dismissing. Sure, to most people, it looks like if terms of service were a car, just very ignorable. But in its operation, it's confidently durable and resilient, and that is what you're really paying for here, not a slick, semi-futuristic, loyal interior. I mean, the Eagle has sort of a recursive look, with design trends folding back in on themselves like saltwater taffy so that everything appeared as though it was stuck in the 1970s, but with a touch of the minivan family aesthetic of the 1980s. The interior of an AMC Eagle was made not to offend. It denies the future. It's 1986, but it feels like 1976 in here. Just a blank slate you can hardly be bothered to notice. And the exterior, with all its bulky curves and a front face with more squares than a Scrabble factory, it's just an odd car for a time of transition in the American auto industry. But there's something irreducibly familiar about this car because it does hark back to so many different elements of AMC's history. An AMC Eagle sort of smells like your grandfather's flannel jacket that he wears indoors now because he's cold all the time and farting all the time and starting every sentence with remember all the time. It's 1986. Remember 1976? Remember when things weren't complicated? Remember when you didn't have to use a condom? AMC remembers. Remember muscle cars? Remember when you didn't need two popsicle sticks and a flesh-colored scrunchie to keep it up? Dodge remembers. But, okay, so to what extent was an AMC Eagle even meant to be cool, you know? You're not supposed to think of this as part of the 4x4 off-roading truck market. You're supposed to look at these as regular cars that give you the peace of mind of four-wheel drive and the freedom not to use it. 
I talk about this in my RCR Stories video on AMC, and I promise the one about Saab is coming soonish, but it all goes back to Roy Lunn, the chief design engineer for Jeep, looking into creating a new line of four-wheel drive cars that would move the company away from its over-reliance on shared platform vehicles. The goal? Something that felt different from the gremlins and hornets and pacers that had typified the brand for so many years, but also not completely breaking with that tradition either offering something fuel-efficient that wouldn't drop the ball in the looks or performance department. And so Lund began with Project 8001 Plus 4, a project to apply four-wheel drive capabilities to the design philosophy of your average rear-wheel drive car all on a unibody. Naturally, Lund met resistance because people didn't think unibody cars could handle the load, but he kept pushing, and over time the initial design was refined as necessity dictated like increasing ride height by two and a half inches and switching over to the inline six instead of a V8. I'll let you decide whether this is all for better or worse. But by the time the Eagle finally debuted in 1979, the cars were full-time four-wheel drive, but AMC would later add the Selectrack four-wheel drive feature, which allowed the driver to improve fuel economy by being able to switch between two- and four-wheel drive on a whim. You could even tow with an Eagle, with the optional trailer towing package getting you a 3,500-pound capacity. There was every hope that this would be the car to get AMC back on track, because it was very much this perfect intersection of traditional AMC and the Jeep-type vehicles that were keeping the brand afloat. At this point, the Renault partnership was in full swing, since AMC had been strapped for cash and needed help. But sometimes, you know, partnerships work at cross-purposes, because there isn't just one company or one fleet to worry about. The brand was still mostly being carried by their Jeep line for a time, and you have to follow the money, especially with Renault trying to develop their own new cars. But I think the bigger issue the Eagle faced was, again, the reality that it was a full decade or more ahead of its time, with minivans taking over as the trendy car of the moment, the Eagle's proto-SUV styling was easily overlooked. By the time Chrysler sealed the deal with backroom handshakes to get AMC in the late 80s, it was all over but the autopsy, since Chrysler really just wanted the Jeep brand. For Chrysler, the margins were so much sweeter on warmed-over, archaic Wranglers to sell to eager men desperate to supplement their impotent patriotism. Eagles were a niche market car, so it made more financial sense to both AMC and Chrysler to surrender to Subaru the entire American market share than to try to compete with Japan on this. And so the Eagle was buried like lost treasure. Except we're back now to dig it up. For me, the AMC Eagle has always been a sword coated in memory and shoved into a cold, unmoving stone until someone with the proper level of appreciation comes to free it from oblivion. I'd love to have this car for nostalgia purposes while also recognizing that it's achingly impractical for me. But then, so is a Mustang. Yet I'm glad for people like Harry, who keep these gems on the road. I drive this and I realize I'm close to the age my mom was when she owned this car, and I wonder if she felt the way I do now, if she ever had worries about silly things that didn't really matter, things that had nothing to do with family, you know? Because when you're a kid, it's strange to think of a parent as someone who's their own person, independent of being your parent, that they have their own interior world that has nothing to do with you. I used to wonder what my mom dreamt about, if she even dreamt at all. The childish notion that you simply stop having imagination after a certain age, that the synapses stop firing. I can only imagine how hard it had to have been as a single mom with a career. My grandmother lived with us and was a huge part of raising all of us, and we loved her, but it's still hard to think of my mother allowing herself the freedom to have moments of personhood that weren't intrinsically centered on her kids. As she once told me, I feel like I was put on this earth to be a mother. But it's strange to think of the amount of personhood that's sacrificed in the name of being a parent. Yet that doesn't mean they're sacrificing their interiority. That in their own minds, they don't still retain some semblance of the person they were before they had you. I used to think that since heaven and hell were opposites and people replaced oh my god with oh my gosh, then clearly gosh was the opposite of god and the master of hell. There is a very speculative naivete that borders on stupidity when it comes to childhood. Or maybe it was just me. 
but as a kid, this is what I thought a car was. And for years after, and many since, this was a car that stood as my template for what a car should be. And I'd get mad when other cars weren't like this, weren't this warm and comfortingly familiar, weren't this all-encompassing like some sort of mechanical hug, which was really kind of dumb on my part. It'd be like being mad at Elden Ring for being too hard, or hating Disco Elysium for being too weird. Yet I like cars that are confident in their weirdness, and don't need tons of mods or swaps to achieve uniqueness. Sure, you could do an engine swap here, but an AMC Eagle is like an artist, afraid of taking medication for fear of losing the pain that animates them. There's something artful about this car, to where I love it as much now as I did then. No, it's not as great as I was hoping. But when you find something you love, it doesn't have to be perfect. And it doesn't have to be the only thing you think about. It just has to be what it is.